Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, as some folks are coming in, I'll give a short introduction to our topic. So uh, the connection between faith and business, religion and business, is one that probably not too many people uh, think about. Uh, certainly, uh, it's, a, it's a very unique topic. Uh, but I'm going to start with five data points that helps to frame our discussion. So uh, you can find these data on uh, the fa my foundation. I'm Brian Grimm, the Thank president you. of the Religious Freedom and Business Foundation. And you can find that on our website under latest. So first, we live in a world that where religious populations will outgrow religiously unaffiliated populations by a significant margin. The latest demographic data uh, projects that religious populations between now and 2050 will grow by 2.3 billion people. Uh, by comparison, religiously unaffiliated populations will only grow by 0 0.1 billion people. So that's like religion winning 23 to 1. So we'll be living in a much more religious world. So with these religious demographic changes, it's also going to change the religious, the global marketplace. We'll live in a much more religious marketplace, but also one different from today. Today, one, uh, three out of every, f three out of the five top economies are Christian majority. By 2050, according to data from the IMF, only one of the top uh, economies will be Christian majority, and the other, th uh, other four will include Muslim majority, Hindu majority, and uh, countries with Asian religions as a majority. So this religious change that we're seeing around the world uh, can be very good for global growth, but research shows that it can be good as long it's a, as it's accompanied by respect for freedom of religion or belief from societies and from governments. Uh, looking at data from the World Economic Forum, Countries that, where governments and societies respect the rights of their neighbors and their citizens to have a belief, change their belief, or um, have no belief at all, uh, those countries are significantly more likely to have uh, competitive economies. Looking at the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Index, almost all of them are stronger in countries with this kind of respect for freedom of religion or belief. Uh, for example, innovative strength, one of their measures, is twice as strong in countries where freedom of religion or belief is the norm. Uh, we can actually see this in the, two, uh, the world's two largest economies of today. I'll begin first with China, which might seem a little counterintuitive, um, given that China has uh, rather strong restrictions on religion. But comparing China's uh, history, if you look back to China's history, during the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s and 70s, religion was completely outlawed. There were no uh, open churches, uh, synagogues, mosques, places of worship. All religion was outlawed. Uh, but today, estimates by the Pew Research Center and demographic estimates show that about half of Chinese population is religiously active. Though it has the largest atheist population in the world, it also has the largest Buddhist population in the world, the largest Taoist population in the world, the largest folk religion population in the world, the ninth largest Christian population, and the 17th largest Muslim population in the world. So had the Chinese government not relaxed these restrictions on religion, then we couldn't see chi the China of today being successful. So many people would be left out of <laughs> the China experience and, and buying into the, the project of China's development. Second, the United States, the largest economy. Uh, research uh, that my foundation did estimated that, estimates that religion adds $1.2 trillion to the economy every year. So just by putting that in perspective, that would make U.S. religion, the 15th largest national economy in the world, ahead of 184 other countries. That would make religion and its economic contribution to the United States uh, larger than the 10 largest tech companies, Google, Apple, Amazon, and others combined on an annual basis. 
It would make it 50% larger than the six largest oil and gas companies in the US. So you could say religion pumps a lot of spiritual and economic fuel into the US economy. That report, which came out two years ago, uh, was covered around the world by news media, including uh, the, uh, the Guardian newspaper, which you know, uh, did a special report on the study. And that report was shared 19,000 times uh, by Guardian readers. Now, that sounds like a lot, but to give you a, a metric to compare it to, that was the same year Donald Trump was elected as president of the United States. And their headline story on November 9th, in, uh, 2016, that Donald Trump wins US presidency was shared only 17,000 times. So that means the readers of The Guardian found that religion contributes to the economy more surprising, interesting, or maybe even shocking than the election of Donald Trump, which no one's expected. So religion and religious, religion related and religious friendly businesses uh, are very common around the world. Just using uh, the US as an example, uh, one of our largest meat producers, protein producers, is Tyson Foods with 120,000 employees across the US. They employ chaplains in their, each of their factories to help with the spiritual needs of their employees. Other major companies that have come from, were started and grew in the US, like Walmart, began from evangelical roots in Arkansas. Uh, the Marriott hotel chain was started by um, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or otherwise known as Mormons. And uh, other companies uh, like um, Kellogg's came from Seventh-day Adventist roots. So if you eat cornflakes, uh, those have religious root, growing out of religious roots. Well, we have a very distinguished panel with us today to discuss this connection between uh, faith and business, religion and business. And uh, so I'll introduce them as, as uh, I'll have each of them share uh, three or four minutes at the start, some of their initial thoughts. And then, uh, then we'll have some more dialogue up here and then we'll uh, look to save the last maybe 20 minutes for questions that, that you might have. So our first speaker is Flor Spari, chairman, chairperson of the Marburg Group uh, from Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Austria. Yes. So, Floor. Yeah, hello everybody. I'm very honored to be here, very happy. And congratulations, Brian, to your precious work for religious freedom. We really like that. Thank you. Um, well, I think we are in the midst of a huge paradigm shift. And paradigm shifts in history were always driven by religions and ideologies on the one hand, and uh, by new technologies and inventions on the other side. And economy works somewhere in between these spheres, but it's very important because it can function as a catalyst. So what is this paradigm change, paradigm shift about? Um, I think, speaking in economic terms, we are moving from an economy of profit to a, an economy of purpose. And this is because we realize that the economy of profit and the mindset and the lifestyle going along with it has brought us to our limits where we not only destroy our environment and our natural resources, you know, in Switzerland we are living as if we had uh, 3.1 planets, but we also uh, destroy our very selves, which can be seen in growing uh, rates of psychological problems in the, in the what we call high developed countries like burnout, depression, suicide, and so on. So, but when we say economy of purpose, which everybody is speaking about, we have to define this purpose. And uh, if I think of things that can be an ultimate purpose, always Aristoteles comes to my mind, because he is the, the scholar, the philosopher, whose works were passed over a long time ago from the Muslim world to the Christian world here on the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, he said there is only one thing that can be an ultimate purpose, and this is very simple, happiness. And he knows, the Greek uh, language knows two words for happiness. The one is eudaimonia, and the other thing is hedonia, which is a short-lived uh, satisfaction of physical desires. And Aristoteles says 
eudaimonia is the one that can serve as such an ultimate goal. So I like happiness as a guiding light because it has the character to connect all spheres of human culture like philosophy, religion, economy, politics, <coughs> science, education. And of course, in modern times, we have defined, to define this uh, concept of happiness. Um, and we all agree that it has, it, it has to include all human beings. But beyond that, as religious people, I would also include our origin, the creator, and uh, animals and nature. And uh, it has to address not only the, the physical conditions necessary for happiness, but also the training and the education of spiritual, mental, uh, emotional, social skills necessary to experience and to, to feel happiness. And um, religions, here's where religions come on the stage, because religions were not only the ones who have, uh, given, fun, uh, quest who have given answers to the fundamental questions of life, but they also develop practical trainings like meditation, prayer, uh, fasting, service, and uh, neurosciences, brain sciences, they realize that, that this, they prove that these practices are very important for a happy and healthy life nowadays. And one other thing, religions have also had this longing for paradise and for perfection. Uh, so I can see, for instance, in the United, United Nations 17 Global Goals or the Human Development Index, I can see uh, worldly expressions of this innate uh, human desire for paradise, for, for uh, perfection, because paradise is also the place where we live in harmony with our surrounding, with each other, and especially with nature. But I would uh, put also the spotlight on another initiative which I like personally, which is the GDH, the small kingdom of Bhutan, has developed the idea of GDH, the cross domestic happiness, because they wanted to measure their national success in happiness, like the economists are used to do, to measure it in, as a, with a GDP. And so they invited scholars from all over the world to elaborate screening tools to measure national happiness. And there are also attempts to break down such screening tools on smaller levels, corporates, for instance, in order to, to help them, to support them in their decisions, to measure their decisions in terms of uh, long-term happiness of clients, of employees, of society as a, gen as a whole, uh, for nature, and also for future generations. So we believe that such innovative ideas based on the right set of belief uh, together with new technologies like artificial uh, intelligence and the blockchain have the potential to lead us into a completely new era. In our family office, we are in the wealth management, uh, we belong to the early investors into the blockchain technology because uh, we believe that it will radically change the way we, we think today about business, money, institutions, participation, and property and wealth. And we believe that they can really also contribute and help to make this planet more peaceful, fair, and happy. So, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, so connection between your religious philosophy and blockchain. I'd like to come back to that a little bit more. And then the connection of, with uh, happiness. And, and as you know, in the US, uh, in our Declaration of Independence, the pursuit of life, liberty, yes. and the uh, pursuit of happiness is, is a, a core value. Uh, and then just thinking of the research that you pointed out on health and uh, spirituality. So, uh, you know, that's a, a large body of research with volumes showing that connection. So, thank you for sharing. So, our, our next panelist I'd like to introduce is uh, James Kong, and he is the, um, uh, he's a football agent. That's right. Uh, <laughs> but he's also the Assistant Secretary General of the World Federation of Confucian Descendants, 
And ladies and gentlemen, you have a direct descendant of Confucius sitting beside me. And I'll let him explain a little bit what that means and um, some of the connections to China. So James, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, and uh, I share Spari's uh, admiration for the work you're doing. And thank, uh, you. thank you, everyone, for being here. And it's a pleasure to be on the panel with everyone here as well. Um, so the World Federation of Confucian Descendants is, uh, as, as some of you might know, Confucius lived 2,560 uh, years ago, about. Um, and we have the longest family tree in the world, so we handle uh, internal matters to do with uh, the family because, well, there's a lot, there's a lot of members. Um, so uh, my grandfather is the, the chair of the organization, and then my father, and then myself. Um, and so as descendants, we have a certain role and duty to, to the family and to the culture uh, to, uh, to deal with uh, promotion of Confucian, uh, Confucianism, I suppose. It's not really promotion, but education of Confucianism. Um, and uh, that's where, where I am. Um, I believe it's, it's very interesting, like you mentioned about uh, China and the, how that it's got the largest atheist uh, uh, population and uh, Buddhist population. And you're right, because China is it's a very interesting uh, nation in the way that it handles religion. Um, there are the five biggest religions are Buddhism, in order of biggest to smallest Buddhism, Taoism, Islam, Catholicism, and Protestantism. Um, but uh, what is an over an umbrella a, a, across all of them is Confucianism, because Confucianism is a philosophy, and while debated its religion, there is no membership, um, which is why I disagree with uh, Confucian as a noun, it could be called you are Confucian. I, I disagree with that because you're meant to challenge what he says. You're not meant to take it literally. Um, but it has affected Chinese culture. And as I'm sure everyone here on the panel will say that, uh, you know, religion has affected the business in some way. Confucianism has affected Chinese business. Um, and it, again, it's amazing because people in China, whether they're Buddhist, they're Christians, whether you know, it's Islamic or anything, they, they are still using Confucianism in the business, very much so. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly tell a little anecdote about uh, a little girl um, who, because when I was uh, 16 years old, I was, t I was giving some classes of Confucianism um, in uh, separate schools. And I would give my name card at the end of them, and I said, if you have any more questions, feel free to contact me, because uh, obviously it's a one-hour class, and it's, uh, there's a lot to, to get through. Um, and she said, she contacted me around a year later, and she said, I've been really interested in Confucianism, I've been studying it, it's been really, really interesting, but my family's Christian, uh, and Christmas is coming up, and I want to convert <laughs> to Confucianism, so can I, can I celebrate Christmas? <laughs> which I said, yeah, of course you can celebrate Christmas. I celebrate Christmas. Um, but that, you know, it, it, it's a philosophy, it's a way of life. So yeah, go ahead. Um, so it, it, it's something that unites uh, different religions in, in, in China and affects the, the, the culture of business. And I'm just, I've written down uh, a few quotes from uh, the Analects, which is um, a book written by his disciples, if you, if you didn't know, um, of his sayings, there are 20 books. Uh, it's a lot of good sayings, actually, the, a lot of fun. Uh, not all of which I disagree, uh, I agree with, um, and that's what Confucius wanted. He, want, he wanted you to challenge what he, he said, and he wanted you to think. Um, and that's one thing I love about it. So here's um, a few quotes to explain Chinese business culture a bit better. So in terms of relationships, there's guanxi, which, is, which means um, when you're doing business in China, it's very much to do with your relationship. Your, your business contact is your friend. Um, so Confucius said, the man of perfect virtue, wishing to establish himself, seeks also to establish others. So he would take his friends with him, he would take his business partners with him. Um, in terms of, and, and as you know, China, in terms of business, the, the employee and the boss, have a, they're not, you're not so uh, going to take your idea to your boss so, so quickly as, as you might in, in the West. The relation between superiors and inferiors is like that between the wind and the grass. The grass must bend when the wind blows across. And uh, I'll leave this one open for interpretation. Um, Confucius said, a man should say, I am not concerned that I have no place. 
I am concerned how I, might, I may fight, fit myself for one. I am not concerned that I am not known. I seek to be worthy to be known. Thank you. Thank you. Well, one of the, um, uh, one thing my foundation does is give awards to business leaders who advance interfaith understanding and peace around the world. And we do this together with the United Nations. And one of our nominees was a Confucian businessman from, from China this year. Right. And, um, and he refused to, uh, to really be considered for the war award because he felt he wasn't worthy enough. Yes. Um, that sounds about right. That sounds <laughs> yeah. about right. <laughs> sounds and, uh, about right. So, uh, and, and just the points you're making about Confucianism being a philosophy, being you know, something that whether you're Christian or Muslim or atheist, um, it's a unifying force. I think is something, let's come back to that a little bit more in our discussion of how that affects Chinese business, Chinese business thinking. Sure. Thanks. So next we have King Hussein. And uh, I don't know if you want to explain your name. This is not actually the King, King Hussein of Jordan, but uh, King Hussein is the CEO, uh, sorry, CEO of the uh, Span Construction and Engineering Company, which is operating on four continents. and builds all, the, if you know the big uh, store chain, Costco, builds all the Costcos. So, King Hussein. Yeah, thank, thank you, Brian. Uh, yes, I'm not from Jordan. I grew up in India, and um, you know, it's a long story about my name, so I won't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Brian, your question regarding the role of um, religion and business, uh, you know, I believe that my faith has en enabled me to establish core principles to guide my business from the very start. These core principles um, are, uh, became the foundation of my business. And these principles are ingrained in the culture of my company. And as we all know, culture defines the company. And my religion defines me and sustains me even in my business. Yeah. Obviously, you know, it's good. I don't want to sound idealistic and by no means I'm, you know, I'm perfect in everything I'm trying to do, but we strive to use this, these principles to manage not only my business, but also my personal life as best as I can. Okay. Um, after graduating with a master's degree in engineering and starting my professional career, my definition of success was education plus opportunities plus hard work equals success. And I was, I was comfortable with looking at success in, in that uh, realm. But after I, I embraced my religion, my defin it didn't take long for my definition to change. My, de my, my definition since then and now is uh, education plus opportunities plus hard work plus God, definitely equal success. And I know that that has been the case in, in my life. Uh, the world, the secular world, considers success, especially in business, as making profits, as making money. Uh, this may sound very idealistic, but we, we don't focus on how much money we'll make on every project, every opportunity. If we follow these principles, we found that, success, that money is a byproduct of following these principles without compromising. So that's the direction my life has taken, especially in my business career for the last 38 years. Thank you. And I want to come back to some of those principles and some of the decisions you've had to make. And 
putting that faith to practice in your business as we come around to the discussion. Um, but thank you, and, and, and that actually leads us into uh, Don Larson, uh, who is the CEO and founder of Sunshine Nut Company in Mozambique. And uh, Don uh, puts these faith principles to practice maybe in a more, in a, in a very radical way. So yeah. just some, sure. someday, Brian, that's what I want to be. Yeah. <laughs> and we have a very paralleled story. Yeah. Um, Don Larson, uh, up until 2011, I had over 20 years in the food industry. Most of those years were with Hershey Chocolate. And I, I had a, a bunch of different jobs there because I was a turnaround specialist. So anything that was helplessly broken, they sent me to fix. Uh, my last job there uh, was director of cocoa operations. So I bought the cocoa for Hershey. And that is what got me to take my first trip to Africa. And it was on that trip that I was profoundly affected um, by the environment. I saw so much potential, yet so little hope and so little opportunity. And I came back from that trip. I actually quit Hershey a year later. Um, part of my job as the director of cocoa operations was to buy the cocoa, but was also to shut down the main Hershey factory and outsource cocoa processing that had been being done for 100 years. So I actually stepped on board to build a very large cocoa processing factory, one of the largest in the world, for a group of foreign investors um, down in the Philadelphia area, which is the cocoa port for the United States. And it took two grueling years to get that thing up and running. It was fully automated. And at the end of those two years, we were selling into Hershey, $100 million. Um, and I got a call one day, said, thank you very much, Don. Could you pack all your things and get out of the office by today? And the next day, they sold it to the largest chocolate maker in the world, Barry Calabat, out of uh, Switzerland. So I was quite disillusioned. Um, despite some great job offers, I elected to take some time off and develop my, my faith more. And it was a very interesting experience for my friends, family, and uh, acquaintances, because I took two years off and basically went into the woods. And not, it was very similar to a Catholic monk, I think, even though I'm Protestant. And what that led to was a, uh, a development of a, of a business model I call the Sunshine Approach. And it's a model that's based on how I thought God would run a business, uh, which was the core principles would be to take care of the poor, the orphaned, and the widowed. And it's based on mutuality. The Sunshine Approach business model is a value-based business where dignity, love, and community come together with excellence. And what is our mission? It's to build food factories in third world nations to bring lasting economic transformation. And transformation is our key word. It is embedded in everything that we do. I, I actually... Um, coined the term uh, for these particular attributes, uh, qu uh, quadruple bottom line business, where the normal triple bottom line of corporate social responsibility is in fi financial, environmental, and social objectives. We put on a, an intentional transformational objectives because social was giving. It was doing soup kitchens or, or things to help uh, from, a, from a handout standpoint. We transform people's lives, and that's our objective. <clears throat> and so the key components of that sunshine approach is to take the crops from smallholder farmers, uh, who are subsistence farmers, and make premium food products to sell in the world's finest retailers. We do all that in country, and that is creating a market for the poor. We hire mostly men and women who were abandoned and orphaned in their youth and train them to be leaders in business, and uh, that is introducing value addition. <clears throat> we invite all links in the value chain to do the right thing, such as our suppliers, our distributors, our retailers, and consumers. And that is fostering mutuality. And then we donate the majority of our shareholder distributions to help the poor and orphan in the countries where we operate. It's things that I learned from Milton Hershey, who gave his company at the end of his life to an orphan school but he also built the community around him, not just in Hershey, Pennsylvania, but also in Cuba when he was there uh, with the sugar. 
So that ex exemplifying generosity. So our factory is an engine of transformation in a designated geographic area which jumpstarts the process of job creation, hope, and opportunity. My wife and I moved there to Mozambique seven years ago. We started Sunshine Nut Company. We are roasting hot cashews, hot meaning um, filled with hope, opportunity, and transformation. <laughs> For three years, we've been in the U.S. market selling in the best retail chains, Whole Foods, Wegmans, Giants, Stop and Shop, Raley's, Sprouts, HEB, and others. There are opportunities galore in new channels, new pack types, new countries, but there's a lack of working capital. Why? Because I'm located in Mozambique. It's a very risky area, and not many people want to, to, to have the risk of, of investment. But our philanthropic work, it's done by my family and my employees. We do farming village upliftment, but we also do orphan care, which is a big tenant. The orphan care is done through sunshine houses. We do some established orphanages and support that, but we pair up, we buy homes, we pair widows with orphans, a widow with three to four orphans, and make a family unit. And uh, Mozambique is 10% orphaned, probably uh, an equal number of abandoned children and an equal number of women who've been either abandoned or widowed that are struggling to survive. So our factory is at the highest level of food safety certification. We became a B Corp two years ago and we've had the designation of best for the world, which is the top 10% of B Corps. Um, our 50 employees mean there are a need for a thousand people to be employed in Mozambique to shell those cashews, and then 50,000 farming community, farming families sell into our factory for our needs. So it's it's a multiplication effect of what we're doing with secondary processing. Um, the sunshine approach business model. It's the value-based business where dignity, love, and community come together with excellence. We model value. We instill dignity, we operate in love, we involve community, we, we exemplify excellence. So that's uh, pretty much it. That's a lot. And, <laughs> and I, I, I just want to pick up on one thing. I mean, we've been having discussions among ourselves and come back to Floor on, uh, on blockchain and, and Bitcoin. I mean, what, how does that relate to what Don's doing? How could it relate? Yeah. I think there is a, a good relation because uh, we have so many great ideas in, the, in this world and we have so much capital, billions, um, but how, how to bring those billions into the right projects? And uh, I think our system, uh, sorry, to, I don't want to offend anyone, but is not fair. Our money system, our banking system, it is not fair. And uh, many people are excluded from the banking system who are not bankable, who have no access to bank service, especially in countries like Africa. And uh, the new technology of, of blockchain makes possible a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, trading and business model. So we don't need an institution in between a anymore. And beyond that, it's cheaper, transactions are cheaper, are safer, and are faster. So this is this anyway will be the future, but and beyond that it will contribute. We have these many ICOs going on. Usually heard about that. So that are models like crowdfunding too, but even on a other technological level where we can bring funds into such great projects and uh, really make a change with it. Mm. But there are, I could go on, but <laughs> <laughs> let me, I don't know. No, I mean, it's interesting. So what, what, come back again and just, just focus on, from a, a spiritual or religious perspective, why, why is blockchain, uh, why, why are you interested in it? You, you come at it from a, also a religious yeah. point of view. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I studied a lot about uh, social justice because I think uh, this is the, 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 the paradise, the ideal of religions also, at one point is social justice. And a lot of problems in this world derive from the fact that the, the, the wealth is, is distributed very unequal. So, uh, of course, we, we have this idea and there were many uh, initiatives for social justice 
and great ideas and philosophers working on that, but we never had the technical instruments. Uh, for instance, participation in politics, direct democracy. So we were talking about these things in the 90s, uh, but there was not these uh, technical instruments to do like ele electronic voting and to make it safe and so on. But with the blockchain, we will have this uh, technology. And so this can bring us into a completely new era. Thank you. So we can come back to that some more. I want to pick up on another theme, Don. I mean, you brought up so many themes. Yeah. And um, just, the, I mean, the issue that you're dealing with, you're dealing with widows and orphans. Yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe if I can get uh, either James or King Hussein to weigh in, because at root, it's a breakdown of the family. And, and you're coming in to try to, to deal with that. So, I, I mean, either of you two want to respond to what Don said in, in this issue on family and, and from your own backgrounds, how, how does that feed into business thinking as well and, and what needs you address? So, um, China is a is hugely uh, family orientated um, culture and this is largely due to Confucianism. Um, Confucius was huge about fil filial piety. Uh, unfortunately, in China, um, there are a lot of orphans. Um, and uh, it, it, it's very unfortunate. And this is largely due to the one-child policy um, and the fact that the man is the male, the oldest male son is meant to look after the parents. And the, the female gets married away. Um, and. It, it, for a long time, it has been blamed on Confucianism uh, and Confucius. Um, but for example, uh, you need to modernize. And Confucius did live 2560 BC. So you can't take his sayings now and apply it to, to, to now, uh, from back then and apply them to now and be like, yeah, that definitely applies. Um, so my, my grandfather updated the family tree, and he put woman on the family tree for the first time ever, which is a huge deal uh, to try and fix this, this growing, growing issue. Uh, I wish more could be done uh, in China to, to prevent this. I think now that they don't have the one-child policy anymore, I think that, that there, there will be less orphans. Um, a lot of charity work is happening. I, I, I was looking at working with um, a charity in China which um, tries to, I think it's called Baby Come Home, and it was, um, they try and find stolen, kidnapped babies who were being sold to parents. Um, elsewhere. Um, it, it, there's, a, there's a huge amount of ramifications from that. So from a business point of view in China, I think more should be done. Um, and, and these social enterprises that, I, I, as you said, I hope will be created. Um, there's a huge amount of space for that in China so that people can use the, the business assets and skills to do a lot of good. Um, and I think the government is trying to to promote that. So I'm hoping to see a lot of change. I, I think that's very interesting that your grandfather, who is the, what, 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 what's he's his designation? The, he's the- uh, Chairman. Chairman, the, and he's also the, the senior living um, yes. relative of Confucius. Confucius, yes. Descendant. Yeah. Um, and so by making, so in China, this is a huge social problem where you have tens of millions of more men than women. Uh, so both the females are put off as orphans, but also, um, you know, there have been selective abortions. And so you have a, a large male population that's destabilizing for the economy. And there's culture under that. Yeah. And, and your grandfather has taken steps to address that. So some of these cultural issues that overlap, even though Confucianism is not a religion, but it's, you know, it's a philosophy that you could say is very spiritual minded, yes. yeah, spiritually be. minded. And, and so a change there can be part of the positive change in China. Yeah, we, we hope so. We hope so. I, I think after the Cultural Revolution, Confucianism kind of went underground. and. Um, it's hard in, a, in a, such a fast growing country to grow a culture that can keep up with that, especially in the public eye. So it's easy to go to China and go, this is still not right, this is still not right, this is still not right. And I hope that 
Confucius family and, and, and we, can, we can help be on the forefront of changing this, this pioneering this, this change to bring it into the modern world and to, to update people's minds in many ways. Um, I think also Chinese parents, whether it be good or bad, are sending their children abroad a lot and they're gaining a lot more global um, and modern progressive way of thinking. Um, so I'm looking forward to see what the future will hold and for the people coming back. Mm. Um, and like I said, I, I really do hope that there'll be a lot more social um, entrepreneurships uh, yeah. in uh, enterprises in, uh, in China. Yeah, there's a growing philanthropical community in China. There's a, I mean, there's a lot of reason to have hope in yes, the sector. I hope so. Yeah. And uh, Don, I want to come back to you in a minute, but uh, King Hussein, I mean, you're, um, I don't know if you want to share more about your religious background, but the faith you belong to puts a huge emphasis on family, and that's even led, you know, if I can mention that uh, as a business principle, you don't work on Sundays, and that's a day of worship <laughs> and family. I mean, how, how does this focus on family it seems like that would be detrimental to business, but how does it work out? Absolutely not. It's not detrimental. Um, as Brian, you mentioned, uh, you know, I belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as also referred to as Mormons. And you know, you talked about orphans and um, and um, widows. Uh, you know, our, our church um, instil instills in us a desire to take care of them in practical ways. It's just not something you, you talk about, but um, once a month, the first Sunday of every month, uh, we fast. And the money that we save from fasting, of course, a lot of people will give a lot more than the actual value of the food. Um, and that money is strictly used to take care of widows and orphans. And if that does not meet the needs, then, then there are ways that members of the church will step up and make sure that nobody goes without food and shelter and medical care, okay? Uh, Self-reliance is a very important aspect of the teachings of a church. We do not want to be a burden on society, and whenever we can, we need to make sure we take care of ourselves and our family first. And don't depend on the government or somebody else to take care of you. And those who are less fortunate or are, are not in a position to be able to provide uh, shelter and food for themselves, then I explain to you, you know, what, what, are, you know, what our means are. Um, you know, regarding not working on Sundays, and, you know, again, I don't want to sound preachy, but... Um, the Ten Commandments are not a list of multiple choice suggestions. Okay? I mean, you know, one of the commandments is, thou shall not kill. Obviously, we're not going to kill. We, so we choose to live that commandment. But also another commandment is, keep the Sabbath day holy. Okay? And I take that seriously. And many, not only members of our church, I know... Uh, other religions also have a Sabbath day. It might be Friday, it might be Saturday. You know, to devote that day because the Lord said that I have kept the Sabbath day holy and I have sanctified it. Yeah. When the Lord takes it that seriously, you know, that's one of the commandments. We, again, that was one of the core principles that we decided and it has not hurt my business. Yeah, we've been challenged, we've been pressured sometimes to work on Sundays to, uh, on a project that always is, you know, there's a, in a bind, and we have found ways to increase our manpower, to work over time, and for 38 years, unfortunately, I've been, I've been blessed to be able to accomplish that. And then Sunday, besides religious lead, uh, reasons, you know, we have guys that work on, this, on site eight to 10 hours every day, some, often six days a week. I think for safety, for their welfare, and their quality of life, and time to spend with their families, I think you have a better employee if you let them re-energize, get their rest, spend time with family, and they are more productive five or six days of the week. Mm. 
Well, it's, it's interesting in U.S., I mean, from the United States point of view, many, a, a number, of, a couple decades ago, most businesses were closed on Sunday. We had blue laws, and, and in Europe, you still have um, situations where many businesses close on Sunday, but we've gotten into this cycle of 24-7. There's never any stop of work. Our phone's in our pocket buzzing, maybe even right now. <laughs> and... Um, and just the idea that a company would say, no, we shut down. You know, you, the, you don't have to work. And there's a, a chicken restaurant in America called Chick-fil-A, and they close on Sundays. And, uh, and you can think of that as part of the, what a, a religious diversity brings to an economy. Some examples saying, no, you don't have to work 24-7. Um, and and I had, it has an impact on families and... and, and, and you know, again... Uh, I, I silence my cell phone on Sundays, and, and, and my employees know that we won't call them on Sundays, and they won't call me on Sundays. You know, you, can, you can't live a commandment part way. If you're committed, and, and we are committed, so that's the way we, yeah. you know, we operate. And, and so I'm going to come back to Don, and then we're going to go for questions. So Don, I mean, are you being successful in what you're doing? Uh, it depends on your definition of success. <laughs> so, so are you transforming? Are you? Yeah, so a good example of that is, you know, we, uh, we were a community, a family in, in Philadelphia that pretty much had everything that we wanted. Um, our kids went to a nice private, edu private school. Um, we didn't want for anything. I had my hot air balloon. I flew over a thousand times over the decades and my, my Porsche and my motorcycles and all the toys, and we sold it all off, and we moved half of my family to Mozambique. My two oldest kids stayed in school here, one in college, one in the last year of high school, and we moved to Mozambique and had a radical lifestyle change um, and have put everything that we have into the company. And uh, my kids have completely changed, and I couldn't have anticipated the good change that has happened, okay? And we've had a lot of experiences, a lot of trying and challenging experiences in Mozambique, but the, the nature of the business has brought so many unexpected surprises. One of them was, our, was the creation of our first Sunshine House, where we were dealing with established orphanages. My wife and I would go over there, and there's hundreds of kids, and we were doing our best to bring love and and support to those. But then we had a, an employee call us and say, there's three kids out on the street. And we went over and we met these three siblings that had just been orphaned. The, uh, the father died in an auto accident. Not much later, the mother hung herself in the, in the, the uh, one-room house that they had. And the children, that she sent them out for bread. They came back and found the kids, uh, found the mother. They, in turn, were then kicked out by the landlord, and they're out on the streets with no one to take care of them. We met these three children, devastated, shell-shocked, and we, we believed that they needed something more than the established orphanages, which are really a pen where they bring kids, and there's not a family unit. There's not loving care. So we established where we brought in a widow, and we connected them with these three children, we put them in private school. We take care of their needs every month, which is not much money to do. We foster that relationship of love. And these sunshine houses now, because we put them in a Mozambican village with a Mozambican community, they are now drawing in the children that need love as well, that might have a family. And so we, we started with these sunshine houses now being beacons of light, where they have before school and after school programs, depending on when the kids go to school. It's a half day. And so we've got these houses. The first one that has Cecilia, Madalena, and, and Antonio um, paired up with Zelda. Zelda now takes care of 15 kids in the morning and 10 kids in the afternoon of giving them love, giving them a meal, providing uh, crafts for them to do, a playground on the, you know, and just bringing love in the neighborhood. And the whole community is seeing the benefit of this family formation and, and modeling true family values. So my kids see this. They have now come into the business. You know, it's something that is, is very radically 
happy. Uh, you mentioned happiness. You know, I thought in, in the Bible, John 10.10, 10, uh, where Jesus says, I've come to give you an abundant life, okay? And I think most people interpret that, including Christians, that abundance means wealth. I had the wealth, and I was very disillusioned, not satisfied, and now I've come to a realization that I think abundance means helping people and, uh, and allowing them to come into their destiny and their purpose and just have opportunity and hope. So on that note, any questions that you'd like to address, please? I don't know if we have microphones, but if not, yes. Just uh, identify yourself and, uh, and your, then your question. Hello, thank you very much for, um, I would say, a fantastic overview. Um, it's very practical at the same time, and um, my question is as follows. So you're all individuals who are majority in business. Individuals form the society. Now there is a big problem in westernized countries, and in particular in Big Apple and um, London, where society forms an individual. So this question is to all of you. How can a small person in a big city survive and at the same time implement the religion and philosophy into the business he or he, she is employed. And uh, also, on a practical point, for example, I'm a lawyer, and if I want to publish something, um, an article, or just an overview, and I want to um, cite some, um, some statement from the Bible, it's considered incorrect and politically inappropriate or something else, or another excuse which the, any employer in big city might come up. Or for example, if I want to stop acting based on the religious belief, it's not good for business. So how can you deal it with this without leaving the country and still existing um, in the society? Thank you very much. Thank you. And may, if there's some other questions, we'll take two or three at once. Okay. Um, so my name is Taejun Shin. I'm the founder and CEO of Gojo and Company Inc. And the company name is, by the way, from Confucianism. And we are doing microfinance in four countries, Cambodia, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, and India. So except for India, um, the three countries are predominantly Buddhism nations. And every time we start a business, they, every morning we start with religious observation, which is quite rare in, I think, modern context. So my question is this. Um, so in these countries uh, where I do my business, um, religion sometimes is kind of a symbol of intolerance and uh, conflicts, especially uh, between Buddhism and uh, Muslim people, uh, is the quite rampant these days. And the, sometimes I don't know how to deal with it. Um, whenever, uh, sometimes I talk, whenever I talk with my employees, um, many of them are Buddhists. And the, I mean, sometimes they are quite full of hatred um, mm -hmm. against the, those who um, have the different the religious opinions. And the, sometimes I wonder how can I overcome the situation. And if you have any good idea, please share with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks. David Nussbaum, um, Chief Executive at The Elders. Um, I have um, two degrees in theology and one degree in finance. Um, now, uh, a lot of religious teachers have some pretty negative things to say about money. Um, Jesus, the one I'm more familiar with, uh, you know, you can't serve God and money. Though he didn't say you can't, can't study God and money, so I'm hoping I'm all right. Um, mm -hmm. wh what do you think about how do we handle as individuals involved in business, which I, I'm, I'm also a non-executive director of a, a company on the London stock market, how do we handle the tension between the fact that business tends to measure success uh, in money terms and the pretty negative um, comments about money that you get in many, not necessarily all, but most religious traditions? So the, the measurement question. Do you want to take, take that? Yeah, and one more, one question, and then we'll, uh, we'll have time just for each person to respond. Yes. So my name is Stefan. Um, I have a question for Larson. Um, first of all, I'll congratulate you. I know Mozambique pretty well. I've been there a bunch of times, actually 12 years ago, mm. uh, on a missionary trip, and decided to try to do something. And I was importing the handcrafted goods like that we see in the streets in Mozambique, mm -hmm. the really cool tables. I was selling them in Brazil 
as high-end furniture. But I, and but working with that, like the challenges with corruption, like I'm and I'm from Brazil, and corruption was massive in Brazil. But comparing to Mozambique, I felt it was like Switzerland, you know. <laughs> so yeah. uh, I just want to see like very practical standpoint. How is it for you to face the daily challenge uh, and yeah. being in? I, I I haven't been back in a long time, but I imagine that it, it probably hasn't improved that much. Um, thank yeah. You. Okay. Would you so, like an answer? Well, let, let's save it. Let's just we we're running. We only have five minutes or four oh, minutes. Wow. So, That's difficult. <laughs> yeah, so d just yeah. pick one that you can uh, uh, yeah, address. So and many we'll good questions. I don't know where to start. <laughs> um, uh, well, we are in a financial service business. We are dealing with money. I, it was always difficult we, for me, honestly. I always told my husband, why ha do I have to do this business? So, but I think it's very important to change our concept about money because we put in money everything we desire. But we have to bring money back to the place where it is a tool and nothing else. So it has, uh, this is a tool which needs to serve the right purpose. So that's why also, for instance, in our family office, um, we, we did donations in our family and also in our company for many decades. But uh, then we found out we have to have it more substantial and practical. So we started a social project which is called the Marburg Library, which is a, is a, a it's not a school, classical school because we focus on education, uh, language skills in the first way, and then uh, computer skills and character education. And we sent volunteers from all over the world to an orphanage somewhere in the world who is, where is need. So we did it in Cambodia and Mongolia, and it was so successful because our sons took it over, our employees wanted to go there, the friends of our families around, our investors, so everybody joined there. And it was, for us, it was amazing because we couldn't do this with money alone. It's not money who, who gives such a joy and happiness in, in such an activity, but it's a common experience, creating a community, creating, creating communication and connecting people. So we want to have these places, these children, these orphans in these places stay connected with all these young people who have been there for two weeks all over the time by, by a computer lab so they can communicate via computer and exchange education, language training, computer skills, and maybe in, in 10 or 15 years work in one of our companies or wherever. So um, it's not only money which can do it, but we have to bring back money to what it is, a simple instrument. Thank you. James, very briefly. Um, I'll quickly take uh, this young man's question here. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it, it's very difficult because um, I think you'll find with uh, philosophies, um, for example, with Confucianism, um, he wanted people to, to question his thinking. Um, I mean, there's, there's one story where one of his uh, disciples said, uh, I, I don't like it that we sacrifice sheep at the beginning of every month. And Confucius responded, you like sheep, I like ceremony. Basically meaning, not too bad, we're going to sacrifice sheep. And we, they still do sacrifice some sheep, and I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think because it's not, uh, you know, the, the ceremonies are tradition, but they're not spiritual. So we don't need to do that. Um, and I think that uh, in, in many religions, you will find extremists of, of different sides. And it's very, very, very hard to cope with that, um, other than education. I think education is key. Um, and sometimes it will take time. It will take time to educate. Um, you've got to always, when you read something, you've got to really think, how does that affect me? And, and do I agree with it or disagree? Um, and when that happens and you start to really notice what your moral backbone and what you believe in, then people start being educated. That's why Confucius loved it when he asked questions, but when disciples asked him questions. And that's how most of his sayings came about. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that, we can brainstorm later if you want. <laughs> Good, yeah. yeah. Don, uh, now, corruption, um, the solution. Yeah, okay, so corruption. Um, Mozambique, when we moved there, was the third poorest country in the world. Last year, they were second worst in the world for doing business and compet competitiveness as uh, ranked by the World Economic Forum. They were also the second worst in the world for um, an expatriate living there. 
okay? So effectively, it's, it's not an easy place to live. We moved in, and one of the tenets of a godly business is not to, to pay bribes and to not, uh, not only not uh, enhance corruption, but to stop it. And also exploitation is equally as, as um, rife. The exploitation, though, and, and when you live in Mozambique, you live in these countries for a long time, you start to understand where they're coming from. And they've seen exploitation of their lands and their people for many years, centuries, you know. And then you get into the people who visit have tons of money, and they have none. And so it's this, this you know, you're coming and enjoying our lands. You're coming and taking the natural resources out. We want a piece of that. And they're somewhat helpless to get that. And so when you have that, you, you start to understand the mindset. Okay, now wherever there's exploitation, there's also people exploiting and, and paying off and having a corruption, usually. Um, what we've done, though, is we've hit obstacles, many obstacles, and that's where we have patience, and I have many examples of this. Probably the biggest is one of our main permits was being held up, and I was in frustration. I, uh, everyone I knew I sent out saying, hey, I had one of the most respected men in Mozambique that I met on my first trip. He was a senior member of a government that pulled them out of the Civil War. And when he found out, he called this man directly that was holding up the permit, and he said, excuse me, do you, have you gone to see this man and talk to him? And he said, no. Do you know what he's doing for our country? No. Well, I would suggest that you get in your car and you go over there and you talk to this man, and I doubt you'll come to the same conclusion that you've come to. And immediately my permit was approved. And <laughs> as I go forward, step by step, I gain more and more trust of the people. The business model of giving the majority back helps with the level of trust because I'm there to help the people of Mozambique not just with business, not just with bringing a product that has made in Mozambique on the front of the package in the best retail food stores, you know, but also we care about their, their problems of, of orphans and the poor and value addition and bringing technology in and solutions for them. So I'm looking to gain more and more trust in the government to be able to speak into the things that are being inhibitive and preventive of the things that will truly make a difference in their country. And the l very last word. Yeah, King Brian, I'll, I'll just quickly address the questions that, that both of these um, individuals raised. Um, you know, um, throughout history, people who um, especially um, practice their religion are persecuted. Okay? Uh, I grew up in a country, I grew up in India, the majority of the people are, are Hindus. My family, I grew up as a Muslim, and after India got independence, most of the Muslims went to Pakistan. But my family stayed in India, you know? and there were challenges. But all I can tell you, and I've, and I've had some challenges uh, throughout my life, maybe not religious persecution, but where uh, I was put in a position where I would have to compromise what I believe. And uh, if you stay firm to your commitment, you trust the Lord, yeah, things may not work out always the right. But I can tell you from personal experience, you will come out stronger. I've spent more time on my knees when I'm challenged and have problems than I am when things are going right. And actually, I get closer to God, depend on him, and you have to trust on him. And just because it didn't, didn't work out the way you wanted to, in the long run, it will be best for you. If the Lord would, I'll, I'll close with this, if the Lord would have answered my prayers the way I, what I asked the Lord to be, I wouldn't be here today. He knew what was best for me, and I had to go through the refiner's fire to go in the direction that I was directed to, but I stayed firm. So all I can tell you is, you know, yeah, you can be criticized, you can be hated, uh, and you know you, you are challenged about practicing your religion, practicing your belief. If your heart is in the right place and you keep your commitment to the Lord, because that's a sacred commitment between you and God. Nobody should get in the way of that. 
They can control you physically, emotionally, but they cannot control your conscience. And all I can tell you is, you know, stay firm, hold on to the hand you trust, and, and it, will, it will work out in the end. Well, I'd like to ask all of you to join us, join me in thanking our panelists uh, for this very unique and uh, inspiring session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.